Hello everyone. Welcome to the last session of the day. This is the material science working group here and uh, I am uh, Jennifer Mass, a uh, professor of cultural heritage science here at the Bard Graduate Center. I want to start out with a, a little overview of the issues that the material science working group was going through and then I'll introduce my esteemed colleagues. So materials <laughs> engineers work, of course, very closely with conservators and often in conservation departments, but we do have some terminology differences when it comes to understanding the activity and stabilization of an object of art. And so if you ask a materials engineer, when is an object actually stabilized, we would say when it's reached equilibrium with its environment. This is our definition of a metastable phase versus a stable phase, which I'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about Vanta Black. But sometimes things aren't always what they seem. Um, diamond is a metastable phase of carbon, although the activation energy is so high for it to convert into graphite that you're safe with your diamond rings for now. So, um, in conservation, really we talk about stabilization being the prevention of materials from reaching equilibrium with their environment. And so when I look at the Nam Gabo that we looked at last night, from a materials perspective, I think, yeah, it's really getting there. It's really coming to equilibrium with its environment. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad to see one other artist agreed with me about the, the value of this object in its current state. And so, yeah, early plastics have not served us well, whether it's cellulose uh, nitrate on the right or cellulose acetate on the left. So this paradigm of stabilization, where has it led us in the field of conservation? I would say straight to the asylum. And <laughs> so <laughs> now we have to deal with the consequences of this paradigm that really doesn't fit um, I would say the planet Earth very well in terms of how objects interact with their environments. And what's interesting to me is if we go back to the asylum today and look at the images on the right, then street artists have become very enamored of uh, mental asylums, mostly in terms of the biodegradation that they undergo. And so we've kind of come full, full circle here in terms of not only accepting biodegradation, but realizing that it, is, it creates a work of art within itself. Okay, a trick question here. Which of these three surfaces is <coughs> actually stabilized? Um, from a materials engineering perspective, there's a right answer, and the answer is the Etruscan picks that we're looking at in the center. It is very rapidly moving towards equilibrium with its environment, but I think nobody in a museum would uh, agree with me that that is a desired outcome for this object, although um, these metals do very badly want to return to their mineral states, whether it's by reaction with oxygen in the environment or sulfur dioxide in the environment. If you ask somebody working in conservation which one of these objects was stabilized, it would really depend on what century you were asking. And so in the 19th century, it would be the object on the right with the polished metallic surface that is in uh, the stable state, the state in which it was meant to be viewed in antiquity and could still be viewed today, except we now know from a scientific perspective that there are very few things quite as reactive as a polished metal surface. And so now in the 20th and 21st century, we look to the object on the left in terms of a stable surface where we have what's called passivating corrosion as opposed to the corrosion in uh, the center, which is very active corrosion or bronze disease, we sometimes call it. Uh, passivating corrosion is actually going to protect the object from, other, from undergoing further corrosion. And even going back to Pliny the Elder, he was thinking about these questions when he talked about the idea of a noble patina versus a vile patina. And so this is not at all something new to the field. We've done some pretty crazy things in the name of stabilization, and I think we can use one word to sum it up, plastics. It turns out that um, while the early plastics are very unstable, we see that the mid-century plastics are very stable to our detriment. And so what we're looking at on the left here is the Pim High Boy from the Winter Pure Museum, which was doing what all Japan's surfaces do. They flake off over time because of their very complicated 
layer structures. And so that entire surface has been coated with an acrylic resin, and I guarantee you it will never flake again. And so it's got that going for it, but that shiny acrylic surface can never be fully removed either. And so that object has been forever changed by what we would now call an irreversible conservation treatment, which would be outside of the code of ethics of our profession. In the center, we're looking at a laminated document. Documents were laminated in the first half of the 20th century with different polymers, including cellulose acetate, which we now know leaches acetic acid into the document. And so this well-meaning treatment all of these well-meaning treatments now have to be undone. And on the right, we see the consequences of working with plastics in general, which is that the more contemporary ones are very, very difficult to make them go away at all. And so again, fall outside the realm of what we wanna do in the conservation field. And then, of course, one of the things we've discussed a lot this week is that natural materials are inherently active materials, and we ignore that at our peril, as people did in the 19th and the 20th century when they ignored the hygroscopic <coughs> nature of wood, the fact that wood is going to be absorbing water and releasing water throughout its history. And that causes panel paintings to bend. And the idea that a painting should be flat caused people to put these wooden cradles on the backs of paintings. And what happened, you can see in this particular work from the National Portrait Gallery that was cradled, where that movement was restrained, is that the entire painting has started to break up to match the um, morphology <coughs> of the cradle on the back of it. And so, in trying to prevent harm, we've actually caused um, further harm to this work. Making art with metastable phases. We're doing that now, and I have to talk about um, Vanta Black because, I mean, as an artist, <laughs> who wouldn't love Vanta Black? I mean, you're staring into the void. It's the coolest thing ever. And so, of course, Anish Kapoor wanted this all for himself. Um, but what we can see um, at the bottom left, we're looking at an electron micrograph. Um, Vanta Black is made up of carbon nanotubes that are all oriented perpendicular to the surface of uh, the object, which um, brings up the problem of what's going to happen when the orientation of those nanotubes is changed in some way, even by physical handling of uh, the object. You think about what a delicate surface that has got to be, and then also what's going to happen when those nanotubes start to oxidize in terms of the visible properties of the object. And so what I'm showing in the center there is all of the different, or not all of them, but a lot of uh, the different um, phases of graphene or um, different morphologies of uh, carbon that, that carbon can take on. And so it's actually graphite, the one in the top row in the center, that is the stable phase, and all of the other phases are metastable phases. And so Vanta Black looks gorgeous now, but it's going to be a problem for us in the future. So basically what I wanted to point out is that the history of art <coughs> conservation has been a history of stabilization, but this really cannot be its future. And if you look at trying to find an acceptable equilibrium for an object, we can also think about finding an acceptable equilibrium between all the stakeholders here. There's the intended meaning. There's the intended alteration mechanisms. Not all alteration mechanisms are bad. And so, for example, if we take the wall of bananas at the lower left, I think we can agree that the degrading bananas are a lot more interesting mm -hmm. than the bananas in uh, their initial state. And so we have these programmed morphological transformations, not only in the natural materials that uh, Admir talked about, but also in the, the new materials being created in the 21st century. We have the stakeholder that is the artist. We have the stakeholder of the environment, whether we admit that or not. The curator, society's instinct for preservation, which of course depends upon, for example, whether you're in the United States or Japan, how you would deal with that. The viewing public and then our obligation to future generations when we're making art out of pollen and out of blood and out of bananas. So with that, I would like to introduce the other members of the Cultural Heritage Science Working Group, you got to meet Admir last night. And on my right, we have uh, Mark Walton, who holds the position of Research Professor of Material Science and Engineering in the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science at Northwestern University. And he is also currently a senior scientist at the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts. 
NU Access. Mark worked at the LA, uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Art for two years prior to joining the Getty Conservation Institute in 2005, <coughs> where he was an associate scientist responsible for the scientific study of antiquities at the J. Paul Getty Museum. At New Access, Mark is leading multiple scientific research projects, it's actually astounding how many research projects he's leading, into the structure of the composition of objects in collaboration with museums. His research interests are primarily focused on the trade and manufacture of ancient objects, as well as on the development and use of imaging technologies in the field of conservation and archaeological science. So, okay. oh, again. Oh, we'll introduce Paul too. Yeah, sorry. I'd also like to introduce Paul Messier on uh, my left. Paul is a photographic conservator and so much more, working at Yale and in private practice in Boston. He's the founder and Pritzker director of the Lens Media Lab at um, Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Established in 2015, the focus of the Lens Media Lab is the creation, dissemination, and interpretation of large data sets derived from museum and reference collections of artist materials. Notable among these in the LML's collection of historic photographic materials, which is the largest of its kind in the world, and was assembled by Paul over the course of 20 years. And during that 20 years, he's done tremendous important research on this collection. Paul has also, like Mark, published widely. He holds two patents covering innovative techniques for the characterization of cultural materials, has served elected terms to the board of directors of the American Institute for Conservation, and recently completed a multi-year Mellon-funded initiative to establish a Department of Photographic Conservation at the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. Thank you. And Mark is going to start out first. This happens for us, I see. That's so I, I don't think that anyone's going to be surprised when I too say that I didn't really understand what active materials were. So what I'm presenting to you today is my take on this, which is incorporating the element of time. And thus far, I don't think that we've explicitly talked about time as kind of a mechanism to active materials. So I've entitled my talk, The Archaeology of Change, Innovation, Evolution, and Use of Materials. I also thought that before I get into that, I would start off with um, an actual conservation treatment. This was uh, an object excavated from the site of Vani, which is in present-day Georgia on the site of the Black Sea, dated the second century BC. And we can see a surface uh, that is entirely uh, corroded uh, uh, um, and that it required to be cleaned. And so on the left-hand side, you have um, Jeff Mish, who was the conservator at the, the, the uh, J. Paul Getty Museum, actually removing the top layers of corrosion, trying to get back down to um, what he considered to be the surface. And I, pre I show you this here because that act of actually removing that corrosion and getting down to a level which is representative of what that surface might have been is problematic from a conservation perspective. Um, anyone who's dealt with metals conservation knows that the entire top surface has been mineralized. So what it is, it's the intuition of the conservator, it's the look and the feel, um, and trying to preserve the saline qualities that reads as a metal surface as you're going through that conservation process. So it's a plausibly imagined surface for, for that bronze object. Um, here's another example of a plausibly imagined surface. This is work that was actually done by my colleague Francesca Casadieu at the Art Institute. On the left-hand side, you see this Renoir painting um, of Madame Clapisson dated to 1883 in which we see this background that is kind of gray, blue, greenish. It kind of has this anemic feel to it and it's out of color balance. By doing the materials analysis, we know that the thing that has changed that color balance is the presence of Eocene red, which actually has undergone a, a transformation from what, uh, what it looked like when it was first painted by Renoir. And on the right-hand side, we have a reconstruction of what that surface must have looked like. Again, a plausibly reimagined surface um, that is, is brought together by using Photoshop and some clever printing. And I think someone already showed here um, the Rothko's at, at uh, Harvard Art Museum where there was color compensation that was applied to the, the surface by the means of a projector, which I think is a really fascinating uh, new direction in trying to understand uh, a surface. 
But the thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that we're actually looking in the process of, of the material science here reveals the fact that, that the artists use this material using red, which speaks to the agency of the artist, something that would be lost otherwise, and revealing new information about the artistic practice at this particular time period. To unpack that a little bit further, I wanted to show you this object that um, is absolutely ubiquitous right now. I, I have one sitting right here in front of me. I'm sure that all you guys do too. And I would make the argument that we could relate it back to this. Does anyone know what this is? Ah, sometimes I present this to um, a material science departments and I get it almost immediately. This is the first transistor. It won William Shockley the Nobel Prize in 1947, and we can put it onto a linear timeline where it's shrunk down, it's integrated into circuits, it's responsible for the first computer revolution, I would say, in the 70s and 80s. And finally, by 2010, we have about 40 billion of these transistors packed into this really small, remarkable device. As an archaeological scientist, and that's how I self-define um, myself, what if we project this object um, forward into the future, say by a thousand years, and we lose that entire narrative sequence of events that leads to the construction of this phone. In fact, I would argue that we are so enamored of this historic narrative because it's close to us. We understand where this technology comes from and it gives meaning to this object that we actually see. Um, but I would say that as an archaeological scientist, my job is actually to find out what the progenitor technology is actually and try to look at the actual remnants of that object in itself to be able to figure out um, the, the, the meaning and the purpose of that particular object. This is a black figure vase in the, the Getty Museum collection in which it says, Nikos Thines, uh, made me. And so really that's what we're trying to do is figure out how this Greek artist actually made this bla black figure vase when we're trying to unpack the technology. My group at Northwestern, we're trying to adopt um, three key mechanisms to be able to understand technological change. One of them is innovation, and the, the, I'm going to be showing you these as, as discrete case studies. Innovation is something that happens um, over a very short period of time, usually by an individual or a group of individuals that really changes our understanding of the use of materials. Evolution, um, and I use this, uh, this term um, uh, fully recognizing the fact that built into evolutions, all kinds of cultural um, issues with uh, you know, natural selection and uh, I'm just using it as an analogy, a biological analogy to understand how materials change over, over long periods of time. And I'm gonna try to make the argument to me that you can go from this uh, lapis lazuli figurine to uh, this glass house, which was Philip Johnson's uh, masterpiece in New Canaan, Connecticut. And finally, I'm gonna get into use. Not only is it um, material design, material invention um, about uh, the ingenuity of being a human, but also we can look at these materials and uh, understand how they might have been used by the material vestige, uh, vestiges that are present on that object. So innovation, um, we're really, and the reason that we, it's difficult to find innovation in the archaeological record is simply because we don't have the resolution all the time to be able to pick out these unique slivers of time that actually explain um, going from one thing to another. I think this transition from black figure pottery to red figure pottery in the 5th century BC is a really prime example in which we have an entirely um, um, new way of looking at the pictorial field. We're going from something that is made in silhouette, all the decoration is made by incising um, into this slip that <coughs> was applied to the surface, to red figure, where all the decoration is done with line, painterly, and the figures are left in reserve. What it really becomes intriguing to me, and this all happened over a couple decades in the middle of the fifth century BC, this transition, but what really captures my fascination is the way these two same materials, it's still the same clay material that's applied to the surface, but how these uh, are handled. On the left hand side with the black figure, you can see that all this decorations that is being made to this figure is reductive and it's being made after the firing. You can actually see the scalloped lines as you draw a stylus through, uh, the, ar the artisan drag the stylus through that black gloss material to be able to create the decoration. So it's reductive in nature. Whereas in the red figure vase, we see something where we're, we have laid line. They're literally taking a monofilament brush, <coughs> dipping it down into a vat of clay, and then laying it down to the figure and pull it off. This new way of expressing opened up um, um, the way that forms were depicted on these Greek vessels and changed the history of art forever going forward from, from this point. So that's innovation, very difficult to recognize. 
Evolution. This was actually inspired by um, my favorite cultural historian, Bill Bryson. I don't know if you've ever read this, Notes from a Small Island, but he says, um, I'm kidding about that, um, by the way. Um, Among the many thousands of things that I have never been able to understand, one in particular, particular stands out. That is the question of who was the first person who, person who stood on a pile of sand and said, you know, I bet if we took some of this and mixed it with a little potash and heated it, we could make a material that would be solid and yet transparent. We would call it glass. Call me obtuse, but you could stand me on a beach till the end of time. It never would occur to me to try to make it into windows. <laughs> One of the things that Bill Bryson, I think, missed in, in writing this is this idea that we can look at the change of material usage over long periods of time. If we take a look at this case of the connection between lapis lazuli and float glass, um, as represented by, by this, this house that communicates with nature, we can start to actually see this at, at work. Lapis lazuli was mined from a single um, valley in the Kokochka River Valley in the middle of Afghanistan, as remote today as it was in antiquity. And it, this material had to travel across Persia, through the Levant, and finally end up in Egypt in the fifth millennium BC. You can understand this as a very expensive process to be able to get this material such a long distance in this, at this particular time period. This is a rather, rather large chunk. This is a, a, a figurine that comes from Heraconopolis in the Ashmole Museum dating to around the fifth century BC. The ancient artisans knew that they didn't have a ready supply of this lapis lazuli, so they came up with a synthetic analog. The synthetic analog is the material faience. Faience is um, the, one of the first vitreous materials in which we have a combination of some sort of copper colorant that gives the blue color. We have uh, a flux that's going to melt the, um, the glass material to be able to create that surface finish, and we have a core body of quartz. Um, so we're going, we're doing a transfer of uh, materials to be able to create a synthetic analog. From there, we can say if we heat the material up to a slightly higher temperatures, we can add other colorants to be able to make a whole variety of different uh, material colors. And then all of a sudden we have um, the, the colored glass that is so indicative of the late Bronze Age that's meant to uh, mimic semi-precious stones. By that time, we reached the Roman period, a thousand years later about, in which they're doing the exact opposite. Instead of trying to color this material, they're trying to decolor it. They're adding antimony and um, manganese to be, uh, to be able to produce transparent glasses. And it's not that much of a stretch, a thousand years later, that we're starting to then roll this glass out blow, uh, to make crown glass that goes into a piece of architecture. In the 1800s, we start to roll these, the glass through um, rollers to be able to create um, flat sheets of glass. And finally, we developed the float glass process in around 1949 to be able to produce the glass that we see not only in the Manhattan skyline, but across the world. Following Joe Mercure, I wanted to also talk about using biological analogies to be able to explain th these different processes of technological change. He talks about mutation, very similar to what I was talking about with um, innovation, where we have uh, a wholesale um, manipulation of materials to produce something new, and that's where exciting things happen in the, the entire scope of history when it comes to material change. Then we turn to recombinations where you have this salient technology, but by just heating up and, and manipulating in different ways, we can create new uh, forms of material. And then finally, we have hybridization. The example that he gives is a, of a motorcycle where you're taking an automobile part and you're taking a bicycle and you're, you're fusing them together. But the same could be said here where we're taking something that was initially meant to be a summer precious gemstone or a, a mimic thereof to create something that is transparent and completely different, utilitarian in use. So finally, I wanted to get into use. Um, how to use material science to be able to actually understand this object without having any other pieces of information about it. And this is an example that comes from the Antica Salon in Berlin. It's a white ground lekythos that again dates to around the fifth century BC, the same as those red figure and black sugar figure sherds that I was showing you. And we started looking at this. It has a very peculiar surface to it in which we have different discoloration and discontinuities across that entire surface. Here I'm showing this purplish red discoloration. We have that staining that happens, but it's discontinuous across the sherds. We have sooting on some sherds and not on others. So we started to scratch our heads to try to figure out what's going on here. Well, one of the things that we, we could see just by looking at the superposition of the different elements is that we had this cold applied pigment, Egyptian blue. And I want to emphasize this, 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 this a pigment was always applied to wall paintings, to ceramics, to anything else as something that would be done after the initial firing of the vessel. So you have this <coughs> painted on the top, and then we have this discoloration beneath it. Okay, that's fine. 
Um, so we took a cross section of it. This is, you know, after we do the initial study, we do a couple XRF points. This is where we want to go next so we can understand the material structure. And what we can see here is um, uh, the Egyptian blue, which is sitting up here, which are these laths that have that particular Z contrast. We can see this lens of glass that's separating the Egyptian blue from the ceramic. And then peppering the interface between this glass phase and the ceramic are these nanoparticles of copper. Um, and you can see this, don't take my word for it, I'm a scientist. Um, <laughs> we can see a copper map that actually shows that this, this is, is copper. And I can also say the oxidation of this is copper zero, which means it's copper metal. And the reason that we know this is that we brought it to a synchrotron and measured it. So what do we have here? We have Egyptian blue, cold applied pigment. We have this glass that's interacting with that ceramic down below. So we have an interaction zone here. That can only happen at high temperatures. Copper metal can only be produced out of this thing by changing the copper oxidation shape in the Egyptian blue, which is copper two plus, to copper zero. So we need a reducing environment. So we started to look at different uh, vessels that first have this decoration, just to make sure that we're not looking at an isolated um, example. And indeed, we find many examples of this um, across all kinds of different um, um, uh, museum collections. So we know that we can't attribute it to just that, the antique Sammlung or a particular vessel. Um, so we started looking at the archeological context and here we have um, a tumulus structure. This is a reconstruction of it. This is where a body would have been inhumed. Um, um, first it would have been cremated and then inhumed in this, this um, burial pit. This is an offering table that is right beside this inhumation pit where they would have had um, bones associated with some sort of offering meal and ritualistically smashed pottery put on top of itself and then cremated alongside with the body. So we can start to, and this would have been creating a bonfire burning atmosphere, which would have been perfect reducing conditions to be able to produce our copper precipitates. So we can reconstruct the events right here. So after the initial firing, the vessel is painted with Egyptian blue, it's cold applied. It's brought to the grave site where it was deliberately smashed and placed on one of these offering trenches. It's then cremated in this reducing environment, uh, which reaches around 100 to 1,000 degrees Celsius, and uh, forming the copper zero nanoparticles. Now, when we look at any of these vessels in museum collections that have this purple discoloration, we can ascribe to this ritualistic behavior um, with the use of this particular vessel. And so we can use the material science to actually unpack the, um, the physical use of um, this, this, these lecithoi um, in the fifth century BC. So, who glued them, sorry? Who, what? Who glued the vases? So the conservators in contemporary um, museum collections brought them together, glued them, and, and present them as lecithoi as, as a whole. I wanted to bring this back full circle to uh, what Glenn Wharton was talking about yesterday, and maybe I'm going too far here, about reimagining how art can be used. But this is another reimagined surface right here. We have a, a Donald Judd that's being reused as a living habitat for snails here by the artist Martin Roth. And I, I, I thought that this was interesting, and the reason that I slotted it in is basically as a point of conversation and to instigate further um, debate about um, when does an object turn into one that's like an archaeological object? Um, and we can start to use the evidence in itself to be able to understand what it is. And I think the same thing is true for um, this, which was invoked yesterday as well, where we're going through a number of different material iterations to be able to produce something such as what you see today. Um, the idea here being that the materials analysis informs us that we're looking at something that I is speaking to the fact that we're, we're, we're dealing with so an artist, whether it's Leonardo or not, who's interested in optical effects of painting. And so by showing that, I think it's a real triumph of the conservation field to be able to demonstrate the technology um, and may bring that to the fore instead of something like you see in the 1904 example. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Great. All right, so that was great. Thanks, Mark. No problem. So um, let's see, I'm gonna talk about uh, active collections, expressive dimensions, and it's, um, it's really playing to what I consider my strength anyway, the, uh, the material history of photographic materials. And I just wanted to let you know that um, nobody believes photographs anymore. And so if you're, you know, if you still believe in photographs, I mean, you just have to get over it. Um, uh, I'm sorry to say. And, you know, what Kate Palmer-Albers is getting at here, I think, is um, 
the, the mutability of meaning and the shifting meanings, um, especially r relating to um, photography's supposed um, you know, mechanistic objectivity. So if we can't believe images, can we believe materials? And this is sort of the launching point for my, for my talk. And um, I just wanted to throw this on the screen quickly and say that um, for me it was sort of a blunt question. Can we believe, can we, um, if we can't believe images, can we believe materials? This was a, um, still sort of the lar well, it is the largest um, uh, authenticity scandal in the, in the fine art photography market, and this sort of landed on my doorstep about 20 or something years ago. And the, um, the prints in question looked like this. They were signed um, on the Verso Hein. Um, this is um, the negative. The image is by Lewis Hein. But the question was, did Lewis Hein ever see this print? Is this truly by Lewis Hein? Um, is there an authentic tether from this object to Lewis Hein? And um, by interrogating the materials, by asking the, um, the question prints some very pointed questions, um, we found out actually, no, um, the, these, were, these were fraudulent, um, these were made at least uh, 40 years after Hein's death. And I, I didn't mean to, I, I, this slide didn't make the, the cut, but since Admir was talking about fibers yesterday, um, <laughs> this was one of the ways we did it. Um, we compiled the forensic record and of, of, of photographic um, prints, and we um, reverse engineered it. We looked at the fibers, and we looked at the fibers as uh, biological entities. We looked at the fibers as, as um, uh, objects of um, material history and technical innovation, but we also looked at the fibers as, as commodities. You know, they, they, things are expensive. They come in, they go out um, based on price. And you reconstruct all of that and you have a very nice timeline of what the manufacturers were using, what fibers the manufacturers were using at, at certain points in time. And so we could see clearly that the, the, the supposed hind prints um, uh, were on papers that uh, were composed of fibers that just weren't used by manufacturers in the 30s and 40s. Um, so the next step of sort of my interest here was not sort of the, the subsurface. Um, that's very interesting for sure, and it still is interesting to me. But I wanted to get at what I'm calling expressive dimensions, what I'm, what, what I'm sort of loosely calling the performative aspect of photographic papers. What is it that photographers see? And how do they make their decisions? What are the material, the tactile, the, the, the visual qualities that guide uh, a photographer's um, selection process? And the, um, the answer of where to look was hiding really in plain sight. Every package of photo, not, yeah, basically, I guess, it's a broad statement, basically every package of photographic paper has those four <coughs> dimensions um, on the lower right. So you see the base color, it's ivory white. Um, you see um, uh, indications for texture and you see indications for gloss. And that's wrapped up in the term percal. Percal is a tightly woven cotton uh, fabric. It has almost no gloss at all and has a very fine texture. So we have color, we have texture, um, we have uh, sheen, gloss, and then if you look at the, the bottom, carton, support, um, how thick is it? You know, how, how much of a physical presence does it have? How thick of a piece of paper is it? So those are the four dimensions, those are the four visual dimensions that govern what a photograph in the 20th century looked like. And I just started from those four dimensions. And um, I had a great opportunity um, to work with some colleagues at MoMA. Leanne Daphner is here, or at least she was. Um, oh, there she is. Um, uh, on this, uh, this MoMA project, um, looking at um, some modernist prints from the MoMA collection, and, um, which was funded by the Mellon Foundation, by the way. Um, so we, we know what the image looks like. We have an image, and we have sort of you know, anything that comes out of the, the um, the museum catalog, you know, these the so-called tombstone data on the left, you know, the negative date, the supposed print date, the artist. Okay, we've got all that. But what about these expressive dimensions? Okay, so we can measure thickness. That's easy. We can measure gloss. My gosh, you know, there's a gloss meter. It's simple as can be. They use it in the automotive industry a lot for matching finishes. 
Um, color, you know, the co color measurement is straightforward. We're measuring um, just one axis here. I'm measuring on the blue-yellow axis. Um, so how warm is that base or how cool is that base? Texture was a problem. Um, and one of the ways we solved the problem, we made a data set of te textures, images of textures that we put online and we asked um, teams, uh, computer science uh, signal processing teams, to come up with some methods for us. And um, one of the techniques, and this is, a, this is a photographic surface, this is about six uh, millimeters by six millimeters, um, shown in ranking light, um, very typical um, surface on a photographic paper in the 20th century. And so one of the teams came back, and I think actually multiple teams started with this idea of, well, we'll just use pixel brightness as a proxy for height. So the brighter the pixel, the higher it is. And so now we have, a, from a, a, a flat image, we now have a, a, a vertical scale here, and we can start thinking about this in three dimensions. And once we do that, we can replace this difficult texture metric with, hey, all right, success, 4.9 scale one pseudo area fractal <laughs> analysis. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so we got it. We we nailed it. Um, but I mean, what did we nail? I mean, you know, uh, what does that mean? And so we had to put some meaning to these numbers, and that was the the really big next step. And so, um, as Jennifer mentioned in her very kind introduction, you know, I've been obsessed with collecting photographic papers for 25 years. And, or 20 or so years. And it's not just for antiquarian value. I see this as a genome, I see this as a data set, and I'm all about extracting information from this forensic record. And so we went back to the genome to put these numbers into context. And so the easiest way to, to sort of visualize this is we'll just do one dimension here. We'll do thickness of the sheet. And so this is a, a, you know, a few thousand data points of paper thickness dating from around 1890 to 2010. And our Lursky photograph from MoMA fits in right there. And so visually you can see, all right, um, that's a pretty thin paper relative to the other ones um, that were made in the 20th century. You've got about 15% that were thinner and about 85% that were thicker. So now we can get rid of all of these numbers that don't mean anything really. And we can replace them with sort of these percentile scales. And now we're getting somewhere. So now we see that the thickness of this sheet is, is relatively uh, on the thin side of papers in the 20th century. It's pretty matte. It's right in the middle between warm and, and cool. And it's got a lot of texture relative to the other papers that were available for the past 100 years. Um, and my idea here, I didn't want to stop here because I still felt like we could do better in terms of communicating this information to what I consider my primary constituency, people in the humanities, art historians. How can, and, and it's not a very efficient way. I wanted a, a visualization of these data that was efficient and attractive and that anybody could read. So I started messing around with, you know, ways to express this and came up with this this idea of a glyph. So it's the same data, it's just pr plotted a little bit differently on four axes. Um, so we see that it's, you know, again, thickness is about on that 15% level. Um, so this glyph now stands for, it's a visualization of the physical properties. Um, so now we have the image and we have a way to get at these four expressive dimensions and, and a way to get at it quickly with this, with this glyph. Um, so what good is that? <laughs> um, well, have a little water and I will say, um, so the, the next step of the experiment was we looked at sets of prints. On the left column, there are two columns, well, there are four columns, but on the, the left of the two sides, that's not very clear, but whatever. Um, uh, we have MoMA prints. And on the right, we have twin prints, sort of, um, companion prints um, from the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. And we wanted to use these expressive dimensions, these, these, these material-based um, markers, to 
do sort of a twin study. Are they, are they the same? The images are roughly the same, but are the materials the same? So we went to MFA Houston, got some tools, just made some measurements. And so now these, now these prints are sort of networked, not just by um, online cataloging data, but now they're networked by the underlying material attributes. And we see, hey, wait a minute, these are you know, similar on some dimensions, but very different on other dimensions. Different papers, different materials. Same thing, different conception here, um, visually, in terms of the composition, and also very different papers. And here we have kind of, the, you know, a, a, another different conception, left and right, um, but identical papers. Um, th this idea sort of fascinated me. How can we build it bigger, and how can we, you know, I love this concept of semantic charging, that, um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and so I'm using this, this is one of my favorite objects. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a book of um, photographic papers from a Belgian company made in, the, in 1935 or so. And so imagine a world where nearly 40 photograph, black and white photographic papers w was relevant. Um, you know, we have no, nowhere near that diversity anymore when it comes to black and white papers. Um, so what, you know, what about, what's, the, what's going on here? Why so many papers? What function could so many different surfaces, textures, gloss, sheen, paper thicknesses, what could it, what could be, they be getting at? What, were the, what was the point? And so I started measuring, um, you know, these, these four dimensions. And I'm going to focus on these two, in the upper right outlined in blue and the lower right um, outlined in green. These were on the, end, the two ends, the diametrically opposed axes, of, if you will, um, in, terms of photo, in terms of these expressive dimensions that I'm talking about. So in other words, the large X paper, which was in the upper right, that's the blue paper and that's the blue sort of diamond in the center there. And then there's the Gavelux paper, which was on the lower right, and that actually fills the field. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, pu it's pushing on the boundaries of the field. It's basically defining the, 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 <laughs> the, the ends of the universe, essentially. And if you go back to the manufacturer literature about these two papers, it's really interesting. On the left, the large X, it's all about photo finishing. It's very practical. It's very um, utilitarian. It's, it's all about, as, as you can see from the, the kids going down the slide, it's about one print after another, rapid fire. On the right, you know, hey, your most beautiful summer pictorial <laughs> prints. You know, this is the paper you want to print them on. This is the most beautiful paper ever made. So we have, you know, it says it. I'm not making this up. So um, <laughs> um, it's right there. And, and so if you extrapolate on that, and, and here's where the, the semantic charging comes in, I think, you look at the manufacturer literature, you look at the fluency, this language that was being created, and you can start to, to, to think about, you can pull these words from the literature, you can pull these words from, the, from what was being communicated, what the photographers were fluent in. And on the left, you know, on the inside of the glyph, we, we're talking about photographs that convey or supposedly convey information, they're objective, they're real, they're f it's functional, it's utilitarian, it's about the truth. And then on the other side, when it fills the glyph, you know, you're talking about papers that are all about sub subjectivity and interpretation. They're crafted, they're fictional, they're, 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 they talk about the past, um, they're emotionally engaged. Yeah. Okay, so this is, com this is a little bit of interpretation on my part, but a lot of this is coming from the manufacturer literature. Okay, so like, you know, I'm a conservator and, and we're practical um, by nature, I think. And, you know, so all of this is well and good, but, you know, again, how do you put it to um, some practical use? How, how, can this, how can this be, how can this, it, this, this new knowledge, these new modes of thinking about um, photographic papers uh, you know, um, help us, help us understand and interpret photographs. Um, and we did a, a fantastic project, 
And um, uh, this was um, with, in collaboration with the Art Institute of Chicago and Crystal Lowe, who is sitting next to um, Leanne, was instrumental in this project. And we looked at photograms. Photograms are, are these. These are cameraless photographs um, made by Moholy Naj over the course of his career. Um, and we looked at about 300 or so of those prints, and we gathered these data, um, these expressive dimensions data. And so we went from image to material-based information. And, we, and, and this goes across um, multiple collections. And so the, you know, blue is a collection in Essen. Um, green is a collection in Paris. The yellow is in Rochester. Um, and there's some orange in there. And that's at the MFA Houston. So now we have the, the beginnings of um, some data that we, the, the, the aggregation of data that we can start mining for patterns and influence of one print on another, even across collections. And we can, you know, recolor this um, based on um, where, Moholy was, where Moholy was based. And so Moholy had six primary locations in his life going from the early 20s to Berlin to when he died in Chicago in the late 40s. And so these are keyed now, color keyed, to the different periods of his life. And I want to thank Glenn Wharton for giving me uh, um, the, the inspiration for the, the final slide of the presentation, which is, the, which is these, these starlings. And I'm looking at, you know, these are my starlings. You know, they're, <laughs> they're, they're transmitting one to another. Um, just as one photograph that Moholy would make would transmit to ones, you know, it, re it relates to the one he made just before, and it relates to the one that he made after. And, the, that, and that process is a continuum, just like starling motion. When one bird moves, that signal transmits through the whole. And so, you know, we're at this cusp of being able to do data science on this, and I think w what we really need to do to, to look for these patterns, these hidden meanings, what we really need to do is scale this up. We don't need 300 data points. We need 30,000. Uh, wait, no, we need 300,000. <laughs> um, and that, you know, that's, to me, that's a realistic goal. And I think we should. We easily have 300,000 catalog records for photographic materials. Why can't we can't complement that data with data based on the materials? So that's all I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we have time for uh, a couple of questions from the audience. Yes. Um, I have a question for Mark. Thank you. Those are both such interesting papers. Um, I am really a fan of the Moholy Naj work, and I think that it's really interesting to issue a challenge that I often hear, and I'm just curious to know what your response is, but know that it's coming from oh, a shit. position of sympathy. Yeah, you're doing um, well. <laughs> so, and then, I have a, and then I have a question for you about the particular kind of account you gave. Um, actually, I'll, I'll do those in reverse order. So the question is, um, is there room in your account for chance? Uh, because it seems like when we're thinking about the production of artifacts, yeah. accident, and as Anne Sophie pointed out in her paper earlier, things are often um, sort of invented without a purpose, and those are discovered later and developed in various trajectories. But the initial innovation is not, you, you sort of presented it as if it were always, you know, we've got a problem and let me, let me invent yeah, something no, to solve you're, it. You're, you're completely right about that. And the example that I would cite is from the Roman period, is the Lysergus Cup which is that dichroic glass where you, if you shine light on it from one direction, it appears opaque and you put the light inside mm -hmm. and it's transparent, it appears red, I believe. I, 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 one of those colors. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea, many archeologists think that this was a one-off material. Mm -hmm. So it was made, um, it was not deliberately engineered and it just was something that they prized and turned into this amazing cage cup. But the idea is that it then is, could be, because you have that mistake, it can be serve as an inspiration, whether it's a visual inspiration and that the artisan would actually try to manipulate in one direction or another to be able to uh, create something new. 
Um, and yeah, I think that that's absolutely a mechanism that can be brought into this evolution is that the, the chance the of uh, being process. the innovative process. Yeah, exactly. So the challenge, thank you. I was going to be talking about that more. The challenge comes from evolutionary biologists like Richard Lewington who are very suspicious of cultural evolution, uh, evolutionary accounts of culture because there is no precise mechanism of transmission. So what you have in evolution is sure. genetic material being cast on costly from one to the next, and you can't get those kinds of tight lineages, which are necessary for an evolutionary story. So, so I, I'm curious to know how you how you when, you, when I'm taking a look at the long durée, and that's yeah. really what I was trying to do with going from lapis lazuli to yeah. the flow class, um, you lack resolution to be able to actually say exactly what the mechanism is. But I don't think that there's necessarily um, uh, no connection at all to, to be able to say that it's an evolutionary process. Like there is genetic material, if you will, that's being transferred yeah. from, if, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, 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 you could, I mean, it's a, we're using this as an analogy, so why not actually start to talk about how um, materials go from one thing to another? You have some sort of DNA that's associated with going from a highly colored glass to one that's opacified. It's the same technology that's in place, the same materials. So why can't you actually look at that as uh, the mechanism? I mean, as I said, I'm on your side. Yeah. I look at what you're saying as a, actually a challenge that it, as archaeologists, now these are the moments that we need to be able to look for and recognize when we're doing a materials analysis. Yeah, yeah. Because Bloomington's response is, um, I've actually tried that on him, something like that. And he says, you know, yeah, these are the exceptions, the Roman concrete recipe or whatever. But for the most part, everyday artifacts, you don't, you have... I mean, I learned from my mom so many things, you know? <laughs> <laughs>
very radical. Can you mention how it works? Oh, uh, it's how is uh, it's techniques that are getting better and better in, uh, in understanding what is behind <coughs> those technologies. Yeah. And Sophie? Hmm. Almost artistic research. <laughs> All right. um, so photography is now entering, or has been entering for a while, a post-digital phase, and I know photographers, but also researchers, are wildly interested in, 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 in recreating those practices. Mm -hmm. Do you engage with that at all? Because the knowledge that you bring to the table would be so important that not now this problem is sort of recreated again for, for contemporary photography. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's not. I, I don't know why I'm having to think about it, but I, yeah, I, I do engage in that a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm actually really interested in. Um, uh, it, it's actually an older trend than, than, than now. You know, in the 1970s, there was a whole sort of platinum revival. Um, that I don't know if you, if anybody in the room knows about it, but um, people start photographers, Maplethorpe, Irving Penn. Mm -hmm. They started looking at handmade processes yeah. they were rejecting these sort of you know products of the of the industrial you know industrial world I'm really interested in that I'm really interested in and I've done sort of kind of reverse engineering of some Maplethorpe prints these later platinum prints um, uh, um, at the Guggenheim you know um, and there is a distinct change um, in, in his approach to materials and what he was specifying as materials. And in fact, he changed printers um, when he was diagnosed with AIDS. And it's right there on the butt, and you see it in the materials. It comes through, and, and they look, if you put them side by side, a pre-AIDS diagnosis, post-AIDS diagnosis print, you might not immediately see the difference. But when you start looking at these parameters, texture in particular, and he's going for papers that, if you go back to sort of the semantic charging, he's going back to papers, he's choosing papers, he's specifying papers that um, uh, go way past 20th century photography. They go way past Stieglitz. They're, they're connecting to Durer. More, they're more like Durer, you know, engraving some woodcuts than they are like um, anything, any platinum photograph made in the 20th century. So I, I do think about that a, a, a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I have a question for your made of two parts. Um, the first, um, it, it seems that you're really focused about you know artists making very specific things, and you know photography is supposed to be the medium of the masses. And I wonder where are the masses in all of this, and how do they play into the role? Of your investigation. That would be the first half. <coughs> I don't course. care about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm a maybe, totally leader. <laughs> <laughs> the second half, I mean, if, I'm going to go to work for the Trump if administration. If, if your <laughs> lab will it, uh, exist, um, I guess it will exist in 20 years or so, I mean, the majority of the stuff you're going to deal with is digital photography, right? Um, well, not me. Not you all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. <laughs> all right, so you're kind of running an institution that eventually going to. Yeah, I call it, no, it's interesting. I called it the Lens Media Lab because I wanted to make it extensible beyond, the, you know, the photo, the photo lab, the photo mat or whatever. No, I, I want to. But where is yeah. digital, digital photography within this investigation, within this mode of investigation, uh, even if you don't like it very much? No, I do like it. I like it a lot. I think it's incredibly historic and it's a privilege to actually be alive during this amazing transition from um, imaging with materials and imaging with, uh, with, with immaterial or immaterial imaging. Um, so I like it a lot. I just don't know how much I have to say about it. Um, and, and in terms of the masses, I mean, I'm really interested in um, artistic, you know, again, it's sort of elitist, I guess, oh God. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, a, a lot of modernist photography is based on, and, and Dadaist photography is based on a, a, adopting, you know, ready-made materials, you know, industrially produced materials, materials that were made for amateur use, that were put on the mass market. And so if you look at early Man Rays, they're coming right out of um, amateur um, uh, 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 materials that were made in vast <laughs> quantities and, and marketed to um, individual, you know, yeah. hobbyists and uh, um, people who wanted to make their own f photographs in their spare time when that was sort of a, a, a really rare, funny um, 
per, uh, unusual pursuit. That's just not photographs, so, though, but there's an entire no. material culture. I mean, you're, you mentioned a Bauhaus artist, Lazo Maholinage, Man Ray. They were all picking things out of industrial processes that were just coming off the assembly line. Right, exactly. And that was, that was not a bug, that was a feature. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right, I think we should probably wrap it up here time-wise, but thank you all so much, and thank you again.